Hey y'all and welcome back. I know it's been a while since I've had a chance to work on any new videos, but here I am. Better late than never, right? I've been just a wee bit busy marrying the love of my life. But now that I have some free time again, I wanted to get back to doing these videos. I've been working on a couple of ideas, but none of them are quite ready yet, and it's been a while, so I wanted to give you something in the meantime. So let's see, what's something that I could talk about off the cuff without having to do much research for a good amount of time? Yes, of course, any of y'all who know me know that I can talk forever about the Titanic. Like so many other people out there, I have always been interested in the sinking of the RMS Titanic. Long before I ever saw James Cameron's 1997 epic, I had grown up reading so many of those eyewitness books and other books about shipwrecks and the Titanic. And ever since, the infamous Ship of Dreams has captured my imagination to this day. And I've tried to learn as much as I could about the shipwreck itself, the events around it, and the people who are on board. I read or listened to just about every survivor story, the transcripts from the investigation after the sinking, and just about every documentary you can get your hands on. Why? I don't know, I just, I think it's interesting. My husband's always making fun of me because I love learning about these grisly shipwreck stories and survivor accounts. But you know, then he'll go and watch like a seven hour interview with a serial killer and uh, yep, have fun with that. No thank you, I like sleeping at night. That's a good thing, so you have fun over there with that far away from me. Goodbye, be a crazy person. I guess we just all have our morbid curiosities and this one is mine. So if it's all right with y'all, I'm just gonna geek out a little bit because I'm pretty sure all my friends and family are tired of me bombarding them with all these useless uh, facts and uh, knowledge that's in my head. So uh, now you get to hear about it. Lucky you, huh? I hope you enjoy my little nerd out about the Titanic. So why the Titanic? What makes the Titanic shipwreck different from any other of the countless shipwrecks that have happened over the many, many years that man has floated on top of the water? Well, for me, and I think a lot of other people, it's the juxtaposition of the luxury and romance aboard the ship versus the brutality of its ultimately grisly end. There's also the fact that this is one of the most well-documented cases of a shipwreck during the golden age of the ocean liner. This golden age was actually a pretty short-lived amount of time. For most of history, transatlantic travel, as well as any other long-distance ocean travel, was a bit of a nightmare. For months, you would be cooped up in a cramped wooden box with a bunch of strangers with almost no privacy, poor hygiene, and unpredictable seas, which could either carry you safely to your destination or could tear you to pieces without leaving a clue as to what happened to you. There was no guarantee that you would even make it to port alive. Between the weather, diseases that would spread quickly in confined holds, and the utter isolation of a ship in the middle of the ocean with no land or other ships in sight, it was a real gamble to undertake a journey across the oceans. But as the Industrial Revolution led to more and more technologies and inventions, the trip started to become a little less risky and less time consuming. With new inventions such as the wireless or the steam engine, journeys that used to take months could now be done in weeks. And the race for these shipping companies to make the fastest passenger ship was on. But as competition grew, a lot of these companies started to notice that people cared a bit more about their accommodations than the overall speed of the ship. And since it was cheaper and a more sure investment to focus on the passenger quarters than constantly redesigning a ship to be the fastest, many companies did just that. Rather than competing to be the fastest ship, many companies now fought to be the most luxurious and to make one forget that they were even on a ship. This also reflected a cultural shift in how people used ocean liners. Once, only the truly desperate or brave would uproot their entire lives to relocate to faraway lands, most likely never to return. Now, one could book passage for a short getaway and then be back home within the month. This meant that the people booking cabins on these ships were not solely immigrants who were willing to suffer through a rough voyage for the chance of a better life, but tourists who wanted a more resort-like experience to begin and end their vacation with. And many of them had the money to pay for the very best experience that ocean liners had to offer. These are the conditions that the Titanic was made for. 
While making the fastest crossing would still be nice for the Titanic, along with her two other sister ships, the Britannic and the Olympic, they were designed for comfort, and not just for the first class. While today we like to think of the huge discrepancy between the classes and how much better first class had it, the second and even third class on Titanic were still extremely luxurious when compared to other ships from the era, and especially from before. Keep in mind, many third class accommodations on other ships were nothing more than a glorified cargo hold, mostly consisting of bunks and maybe a few tables. So while on Titanic you might have to share a room with one or two strangers, this was a huge improvement over what third class passengers were used to. What was third class on the Titanic would easily be considered second or even first class on many other ships. And that's just the passenger cabins. The Titanic was also equipped with facilities such as a smoking room, a general room with a piano and a bar, as well as deck space to lounge or get some fresh air. So if even steerage was given so much attention to detail, you can imagine how extravagant first class was. It had a swimming pool, Turkish baths, a squash court, a hairdresser, a gym, and even a cafe whose food wasn't included in the price of your ticket, but was actually run by a separate restaurant staff who didn't even work for the White Star Line. This actually led to quite a bit of confusion the night of the sinking, as most people didn't know if they counted as passengers or crew, so they didn't know whether to let them in the lifeboats or not. The staff of the first class a la carte restaurant were having the hardest time of all. They were neither fish nor fowl. Obviously they weren't passengers, but technically they weren't crew either. The restaurant was not run by the White Star, but by Monsieur Gatti as a concession. Manager Gatti, his chef, and the chef's assistant, Paul Moget, were the only ones who made it to the boat deck. They got through because they happened to be in civilian clothes. The crew thought they were passengers. But going back to the first class, there were even two staterooms that had their own private bathroom, rather than shared hall ones that the rest of the ship used, as well as their own private promenade deck. This was one of the few differences between the Titanic and her sister ship, the Olympic, as the Olympic didn't have these private decks. Looking at all these exceptional features of the ship, it's easy to see why so many prominent people of Edwardian society would book passage on her maiden voyage. You had wealthy business tycoons such as John Jacob Astor and Benjamin Guggenheim, who more modern celebrities such as Dorothy Gibson, a silent film actress who was one of the inspirations for Susan in Citizen Kane, as she was also pressured into being an opera singer by her manager slash lover, who, after she survived the sinking, forced Dorothy to star in a silent film about the disaster only a month after being rescued. She wore the same clothes that she wore that fateful night, and there are accounts of the actress breaking down, crying on set. The film itself is considered lost media, but we are left with a few pictures. But the list of famous first-class passengers didn't stop there. There was the unsinkable Molly Brown, fashion designer Lady Duff Gordon, and even the co-owner of Macy's department store, Isidore Strauss and his wife Ida who unfortunately were the inspiration for that particularly tragic scene in the 1997 movie. As Isidore refused a spot in the lifeboat despite being offered one for his age, preferring to give it to a younger passenger. And his wife Ida refused to leave his side. We've been together for 40 years. And where you go, I go. Don't argue with me, Isidore. You know it does no good. People of interest aboard Titanic were not exclusive to first class. One of the stewardesses aboard the ship, Violet Jessup, would not only survive the sinking of the Titanic, but would also go on to serve on her sister ship, the Britannic, during World War I, where it was being used as a hospital ship. Unfortunately, on November 21st, 1916, the ship ran into a mine and sank in less than an hour. But amazingly, Violet also survived this sinking. And after the war, she went back to sea, serving on White Star Line's Olympic, making her one of the few people who have sailed on all three Olympic-class ships. This is part of what I think makes Titanic so interesting, is this culture aboard the ship. 
where you would find this mashup of high society looking to have a good time and show off their wealth, mixed with the working man looking for a better life in America and already experiencing the taste of a better future on board. There was a sense of hope and prosperity about the ship, which makes it all the more tragic when she met her untimely fate. April 14th, 1912, at 11.40, the Titanic hits the iceberg. We all know the story of her sinking. The unsinkable ship hits an iceberg and sinks with thousands left to drown in the icy waters. Many blame the White Star Line and Bruce Ismay for neglecting to add enough boats because they thought the ship was unsinkable. But that's not quite the full story. While many like to try to pin the blame on an individual when disaster strikes, very rarely is it so clear cut. The people who take the blame most often for the Titanic sinking are the ship designers for designing an unsafe ship and the crew themselves for not noticing the iceberg in time to turn out of its way. We like to think maybe if the crew had done something different, the ship could have avoided the disaster. Maybe if the lookouts had binoculars, they would have seen the iceberg in time. And while there may be some truth to this, ultimately, we can never be sure, as it seemed that all the conditions of that night were working against them. The night the Titanic hit the iceberg was a moonless night, which meant that the only lights came from the ship and stars. While it is true that the lookouts were supposed to have binoculars at the time, it's unlikely that they would have helped if they actually had. The lookouts would have been staring at a nearly pitch black horizon, so zooming in on a little bit of darkness in a mass of darkness isn't really going to help. The only indication of an object in the water was the waves breaking against the bottom of it. But here's where we run into another problem. The night of the sinking was an exceptionally calm night. And while usually this would be a good thing, in this particular instance, it made the icebergs especially hard to see to the point that they were almost invisible. It was this combination of a flat calm and a night sky that provided no light that ultimately doomed the Titanic. The shipbuilders who planned out the Titanic's design accounted for many different types of disasters that could befall the Titanic on her maiden voyage and beyond. And she was thought to be one of the safest ships on the seas. But that doesn't mean that they slacked off in her safety features. They knew after all that no ship was truly unsinkable. Since the Titanic and her sister ships were designed to be so luxurious, shipbuilders Harland and Wolfe didn't deviate from the basic structure of many other ships of the era. It was simply much bigger. So the design itself was a tested design and even had extra safety features, such as a double bottom and 16 watertight compartments separated by 15 bulkheads. These were supposed to stop the water from spreading to the rest of the ship by cutting off access to other compartments once the watertight doors were shut. And these watertight doors could be engaged from multiple parts of the ship, mechanically from the wheelhouse or manually. So why did it sink then? Well, the ship was designed to stay afloat after being rammed from the side, like the Olympic was, smashing bow first into something and having the bottom scraped out. And even though the iceberg did smash into the side, much like what happened with the Olympic, they were expecting all the damage to be focused on one point of impact. We were very anxious indeed to have a ship which would float with her two largest watertight compartments full of water. What we wanted to guard against was any steamer running into the ship and hitting her on a bulkhead because if the ship ran into her broadside on and happened to hit her right on a bulkhead, that would open up two big compartments and we were anxious to guard against the possibility of that happening. The Olympic and Titanic were so constructed that they would float with the two largest compartments full of water. But instead, the iceberg went down the side of the ship, punching holes as it went along. This caused multiple bulkheads to fill up at the same time, overwhelming the bulkheads and letting the water loose through the rest of the ship. She can stay afloat with the first four compartments breached, but not five. Not five. And once the water was over the bulkheads, there was no stopping it. So despite what many think, I think we can safely say 
that the Titanic was built to the highest quality standard of the day, and maybe even a little beyond. But then why wasn't there enough lifeboats? How could they have spent all this time thinking about safety features and not included enough lifeboats for everyone on board? Well, let's take a closer look at that, because the issue is actually a little more complicated than one might think. Nowadays, we think of lifeboats as the best way of surviving a shipwreck. But that wasn't always the case. It used to be that even if you made your way into a lifeboat, your troubles were far from over. Without a radio to signal your location to nearby ships and rescue, you could be floating in the middle of the ocean for days until you're discovered, if you're discovered at all. And that's only if you survive the elements. There are too many stories of lifeboats either never being found and disappearing or capsizing in a storm and being torn to pieces dashed against rocks or ice or other debris in the water. On another White Star Line shipwreck in 1873, the Atlantic struck the rocky shores of Nova Scotia. The only lifeboat that was launched was immediately dashed against the hull of the ship by the rough waters, and everyone on board was lost. Or in another shipwreck in 1904, the Clallam launched three lifeboats, and all three were capsized by the rough seas and all their inhabitants lost. Meanwhile, back on the sinking ship, she actually stayed afloat long enough for another boat to find her and rescue those who had stayed on board. And Titanic's passengers would have known of these dangers, and there are many reported instances where people were very hesitant or outright refused to get into the lifeboats, thinking that it was safer to stay on the sinking ship. Now, would you be good enough to step into the boat, please, madam? Catch my death of cold? Certainly not. And even the lifeboats on the Titanic were not launched without incident. We were carried parallel to the ship, directly under the place where boat 15 would drop from her davits into the sea. Looking up, we saw her already coming down rapidly from V-deck. She must have filled almost immediately after ours. We shouted up, stop lowering 14. And the crew and the passengers in the boat above, hearing a shout, and seeing our position immediately below them, shouted the same to the sailors on the boat deck. But apparently they did not hear, for she dropped down foot by foot, 20 feet, 15, 10, and a stoker and I in the bows reached up and touched the bottom swinging above our heads, trying to push away our boat from under her. It seemed now as if nothing could prevent her dropping on us. But at this moment, another stoker, sprang with his knife to the ropes that still held us, and I heard him shout, one, two, as he cut them through. The next moment, we were swung away from beneath 15 and were clear of her as she dropped into the water in the space we had just before occupied. So lifeboats weren't widely viewed as the best way to survive a shipwreck. Their main purpose was thought to be used to ferry people to nearby ships or land. In that scenario, you don't need enough boats for everyone, just enough to get people to safety and come back for more. We can see this idea even in more recent shipwrecks, such as 2012's Costa Concordia disaster. The ship had listed so far to starboard that all of those lifeboats were unable to be launched. So the ones that were able to launch were used to ferry passengers to shore and go back for more. And believe it or not, the Titanic actually tried to use the same strategy, as there was a ship seen far off in the distance that night. Almost immediately after leaving the Titanic, we saw what we all said was a ship's light down on the horizon on the Titanic's port side. Two lights, one above the other, and plainly not one of our boats. We even rode in that direction for some time, but the lights drew away and disappeared below the horizon. This ship was the Californian, who had actually already given the Titanic an ice warning, but the Marconi operators on the Titanic had responded in not the nicest way. The operator on the Titanic turned around and said, Shut up, shut up, I'm busy, I'm working Cape Race. Now before you get too mad at the operators, you have to remember, this was not their first ice warning they'd gotten. They had been getting them all throughout the trip, and they had to manage reporting these ice warnings while being bombarded by personal messages from the passengers. Look at this one. He wants his private train to meet him. la -de da We'll be up all bloody night on this lot. You'll be up all bloody night on that lot. Oh, yeah. Sorry. 
no chunk. So you can see why one might get upset when you suddenly have a message you've heard a thousand times blasted in your ear because they're so close to you. You might have been a little curt too. And in the midst of this, the machine breaks. Now, it was actually company policy from Marconi that in the event that a system should break down, the operators are not actually supposed to try to fix it. They're supposed to wait until after the voyage and take it to a professional to get it repaired. But luckily for the Titanic, they didn't follow procedure and actually fixed it themselves in their off hours instead of sleeping. If they hadn't done that, then there would have been no way to get in touch with the Carpathia, the ship that diverted from its course to rescue the passengers from the lifeboats. In that scenario, those who survived the sinking might also have been lost. But the Carpathia was still four hours away, and the Titanic was in desperate need of help. Now, with the ship taking on water, and the situation only getting worse, the Titanic's wireless operators frantically tried to get in touch with the nearby ship, but the Californian operator had already turned off the machine and gone to bed. Even the Titanic's signal rockets didn't get the Californian to come to their aid. Speaking of the Marconi wireless system, this was another innovation that was supposed to add to the ship's safety. They could now communicate with nearby ships and even send messages to friends and family waiting for them to arrive. So it was thought that if the ship was in trouble, it could easily get in touch with nearby ships who had come to their rescue and the lifeboats could be used to ferry passengers to safety. And this was proven to work as in 1909, the same year the Titanic's keel was first being laid down, the RMS Republic was rammed by another ship and started to sink. But after sending out a distress call, multiple ships came to assist and most lives were saved. So, with all this evidence against the reliance on lifeboats, it kind of makes more sense why they would only have a few on board. And believe it or not, they actually had more boats than most ships. Back in those days, the required number of lifeboats was based on the size of the ship and not the passenger capacity. The Titanic actually had four extra lifeboats that were beyond what was required. The Titanic was only required to have 16 lifeboats, but it actually had four extra lifeboats that were collapsible and could be pulled out in the event of a sinking. Even if the Titanic did have more lifeboats, there is evidence to suggest that they would not have had time to launch them all, as the last two boats to leave the Titanic were not officially launched, but floated off the deck as the water rose, or otherwise swept away. Lightoller has told me, and has written me as well, that Boat A on the starboard side did not leave the ship, while B was thrown down to the boat deck and was the one on which he and I eventually climbed. With the evidence on the subject presented later, he recognizes that boat A floated away and was afterwards utilized. This boat that Sir Archibald is referring to is the same one that would end up becoming the saving grace of the one surviving wireless operator. Jack Phillips and Harold Bride were two of the many heroes of that night. As they remained at their station, desperately trying to find someone who could help until they were waist deep in water. In the end, only one of them survived. Harold Bride managed to climb aboard one of the collapsible lifeboats that was swept overboard as the ship plunged beneath the waves. It had been flipped upside down, but Bride and 15 other men were able to climb up and stand on the overturned boat until they were eventually rescued by the Carpathia, the very ship that wouldn't have been there if not for Bride and Phillips. The accountings of survivors such as Archibald Gracie, Jack Thayer, and Harold Bride are part of what has kept the story of the Titanic alive for so long and has given us a personal view of what it was like to go through this tragic event. Through these survivor stories, we can also piece together a more accurate account of how the ship actually went down. Since the discovery of the Titanic wreck herself in 1985, we know that the ship broke into two at some point. The bow of the ship was found a good distance from her stern with wreckage and debris strewn about. However, in many films made before 85, she is depicted going down in one piece. Why? Well, that is because the breakup itself was hotly debated even by survivors. Some say that they saw the ship break, and others say that it absolutely did not 
But instead, the horrible crashing sound that was reported by many was the sound of the boilers falling from their places and crashing through the ship. One survivor, Jack Thayer, was so convinced that he saw the ship break up that once on board the Carpathia, he found an artist and described what he saw. These sketches were done on board the Carpathia based on Jack's descriptions. Yet another survivor, Archibald Gracie, had this to say on the topic. I was on the Carpathia when I first heard anyone make reference to this point. The 17-year-old son of Mr. John B. Thayer, Jack Thayer, Jr., and his young friend from Philadelphia, R. N. Williams, Jr., the tennis expert. In describing their experiences to me, were positive that they saw the ship split in two. This was from their position in the water on the starboard quarter. Some of the passengers whose names I've just mentioned are also cited by the newspapers as authority for the statements that the ship broke in two, that she buckled amidships, that she was literally torn to pieces, etc. On the other hand, there is much testimony available which is at variance with this much advertised sensational newspaper account. Summing up its investigation of this point, the Senate Committee's report reads, There have been many conflicting statements as to whether the ship broke in two, but the preponderance of evidence is to the effect that she assumed an almost end-on position and sank intact. But since we have found the shipwreck, we know for certain that she did indeed break in half at some point. So for so many people to have missed seeing the ship break, it probably wasn't quite as dramatic as it is in the 97 movie. As far as media goes, it was probably closer to the Julian Fellows miniseries, but even then, you would think that people would have noticed that. Now, it could have just been the darkness that caused people to miss it, but the lights of the Titanic stayed on almost until the end, so it's more likely that the breakup happened either at the waterline when the ship was tilted up, or when it was just underwater. Ultimately, we may never know exactly what happened. All we know for sure is that the ship did break in half, and this is most likely where that crashing sound came from. The Titanic disaster had a huge impact after the news of the sinking spread and gave way to many improvements in ocean travel. After the sinking, more lifeboats would be required on ships and the wireless system would have to be manned at all times. The White Star Line itself never really recovered from the tragedy, not only from the fallout of the sinking itself, but because the decline of the Great Ocean Liner was just beginning. Ships from many different companies were sunk during World War I. And after the war, while there was a short boom of immigrants from a war-torn Europe, the United States would enact the Immigration Act of 1924 that greatly restricted the amount of people that could relocate to America. This, as well as the onset of the Great Depression a few years later, dramatically decreased the demand for transatlantic passenger ships. And in 1934, the White Star Line was forced to merge with its longtime competitor, Cunard, becoming Cunard White Star Line Limited. And in 1949, they dropped the White Star Line altogether and reverted back to just Cunard. The business of ocean liners would never be quite the same after the war. With immigration no longer being the driving force of the industry, these companies had to shift focus on making the journey and the ship itself the main draw and thus the cruising industry was born. Because of all of these changes that seemed to happen right after the famous shipwreck, many have seen this disaster as not only a tragedy, but the death of an era. It seems that the world that built the Titanic sank with her as the effects of an increasingly brutal war and the rise of new technologies and ways of thinking made the world of the Titanic seem a distant dream. And whether or not that dream was seen through rose-colored glasses by those living comfortably in privileged positions, there is no denying the amount of change the world went through. One of the survivors of that night, Jack Thayer, is quoted saying, I want to emphasize some of the everyday conditions under which we were then living, to show how much humanity was shocked by the approaching disaster. These were ordinary days, and into them had crept only gradually the telephone, the talking machine, the automobile. The airplane, due to have so soon such a stimulating yet devastating effect on civilization, was only a few years old, 
and the radio, as known today, was still in the scientific laboratory. The safety razor had just been invented and its use was gradually spreading. Upon rising in the morning, we looked forward to a normal day of customary business progress. The conservative morning paper seldom had headlines larger than half an inch in height. Upon reaching the breakfast table, our perusal of the morning paper was slow and deliberate. We did not nervously clutch at it and rapidly scan the glaring headlines as we are inclined to do today. These days were peaceful and ruled by economic theory and practice built up over years of slow and hardly perceptible changes. There was peace and the world had an even tenor to its ways. He continued, True enough, from time to time there were events, catastrophes, like the Johnstown Flood, the San Francisco Earthquake, or floods in China, which stirred the sleeping world, but not enough to keep it from resuming its slumber. It seems to me that the disaster about to occur was the event which not only made the world rub its eyes and awake, but woke it with a start, keeping it moving at a rapidly accelerating pace ever since, with less and less peace, satisfaction and happiness. Today the individual has to be contented with rapidity, of motion, nervous emotion and economic insecurity. To my mind, the world of today awoke April the 15th, 1912. Thanks for watching y'all. I hope you enjoyed the new video. This video definitely took a little longer than I expected it to. What was supposed to be a quick off the cuff little video uh, ended up being I think my longest video. So um, you know that's what happens when y'all let me nerd out. And then when I was about halfway done editing the video everything with the Ocean Gate sub happened so I figured I'd better wait a little bit out of respect. But here it is and hopefully I'll have another video out for you sooner. I know this isn't exactly the usual fashion history topics I talk about on this channel, but it's something that I've always found interesting and knew I could talk about. So uh, if you liked it, let me know in the comments. Maybe I'll do more random stuff like this outside of just fashion history stuff. Let me know, like and subscribe and all that jazz, and I'll see you next time. And join me for another nerd out.